It's time for Drummer Nation. Hi, and welcome to Classic Drummer Magazine's Classic Conversations taken from our archives. We're very happy today to share with you a conversation we had with Ricky Rocket of Poison fame at NAMM 2016. Interviewing Ricky was Michael Vosbein, friend to Classic Drummer Magazine in the industry, and this will be presented on Michael's Drummer Nation Network. This is episode one of the conversation, and we look forward to bringing you episode two on a later edition. So, Ricky Rocket with Michael Vosbein, enjoy. Innovation has opened the door for all drummers to have the same access as top musicians in the world. Custom Symbols, now available to everyone. Your next sound just got more interesting. Sabian Custom Shop. Hi, Michael Vosbein at the NAMM Show 2017 in Anaheim, the Classic Drummer Studio, where we are delighted to welcome Ricky Rocket. Hi, Ricky. Hi, how you doing? Very nice well. Nice to see you as always. As always. You and I worked together with uh, a cymbal company for a while. Yes. We, we had the Rocket Ride, Yeah. which was a very cool cymbal. Uh, but let's go back to, to your early days. You're from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and as is the whole band Poison. I think everybody knows you as the drummer of Poison. Yeah. How did all that get rolling? Well, um, Brett and I were in a band before Poison. And we had done cover, you know, we were a cover band. Everybody's a cover band back there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing all the work. We were doing all the heavy lifting. We were booking all the shows. And, um, and I just remember us getting frustrated one day. Uh, and we pulled over in the parking lot and go, you know, these guys just don't want to do anything. I mean, if it was a Tuesday night, we'd take it. We'd just make it our night. That would be our night then. We'll make that a great night. I mean, that's how we thought. And uh, those guys didn't. Oh, they should. That's shit. They should give us a Friday night. You know, it's what well, they didn't. Okay. And finally, I remember we just pulled over and Brett looked at me and said, "You want us to just start do the kind of thing we always wanted to do and quit worrying about what they think and get some other guys that work as hard as we do." And I said, "Yeah, I do. I'm frustrated." And that we set out. I mean, we had drawings of how we wanted things to look. We had songs picked out how we want the sound i mean we we just sketched out the whole idea stage shows how you know just as fans like what do i want to see on stage you know i want to see guys that you know have three and a half minute catchy songs that i ring in my head all night long we want to see guys that are active on stage that look cool that you know we didn't we wanted everything to be succinct you know what i mean and that's what we went after and we pursued it and uh we moved out to L.A. finally after a couple of years because we were young guys and it was hard getting gigs in over 21 clubs. And that at that time, I think the a circuit was pretty much peppered for a new wave, especially in New York, New York City. I mean, it was, you know, Blondie and all that kind of stuff, which was great, but we weren't that, uh, except in Baltimore. Baltimore had this kind of metal scene, you know, the Quiet Riot, Van Halen influence kind of thing. And... Um, that was happening more out west here. And uh, so we said, how do we make that happen? Like, that's just a pipe dream when you're 21 or whatever, you know. And uh, we, figured, we figured a way to do it. And, uh, and we came out here where we knew, you know, um, if we had to sleep in the street, at least it'd be warm. <laughs> I remember Bobby Daw, the, your bass player in Poison, told me, uh, you guys moved to L.A. instead of New York, partially because New York was too close to home. And if we could just jump on the south, Greyhound. Would, yeah, just jump on home. the Greyhound and go home. Yeah. You didn't have that option out here. No, it's a lot harder. I mean, yeah, you can jump on a Greyhound, but it's five days or right. whatever. You know. So when you plan the band, musically and appearance and, and stylistically, who were your influences prior to that that put that together? You know, I've always been very eclectic. I went through a period where I was really in the jazz rock fusion. Okay, and I just knew that was not going to get me anywhere. Um, I was okay at it, but it it um, it just uh, there was nowhere to play that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I loved to return to Forever Band and all that kind of stuff. And it was a period where punk rock was big, and you know there wasn't 
anybody really carrying the torch for rock and roll. But I had grown up loving, of course, the Beatles, you know, um, and Deep Purple. I was like my own band, you know what I mean? And uh, of course, Kiss and Aerosmith and all that kind of stuff and the New York Dolls and uh, Martha Hoople and um, Grand Funk and Leonard Skinner. And I mean, just all those 70s bands. I mean, songs, what was so cool, I think, with drummers back then, and I think you'll know what I mean, when you went to your local music store to take lessons, you learned old standards, you know what I mean? Or you learned jazz, and then you put yourself in a rock position, and now you're trying to figure out how to play rock, and I think that created this amazing hybrid of drummers that like had like mad technique, but they were making it fit into, into pop, you know what I mean? I feel like I came up in like the best era ever because of that everyone's trying to figure out how to how to do it you know what I mean mm -hmm. nowadays it's like you can pop on YouTube and see how everybody plays back then you had to like listen and figure it out you know what I mean Absolutely. try to find sheet music try to watch somebody and maybe you were lucky enough to catch it on Don Kirshner you know what I mean or oh yeah now in addition to the uh, musical stylistic references you made the whole image thing what became the glam band the hair band thing what were you drawing from there you know it, it started to evolve a little bit you know at first we just wanted to like kind of look cool you know what i mean and we had some of those new york dolls influence but we didn't want to go that far mm -hmm. um <clears throat> so we wanted to stay a little bit trashy and all that kind of stuff so um i just think that it was like um you know, Motley Crue started to come out at that time. I think we sort of took all those elements together and just came up with this visual idea. There wasn't like this, I mean, I think now that I look back at it, uh, there was a social impact that it had. You oh, know yeah. what I'm saying? Sure. Um, and, um, but we didn't set out to have a social impact. We just wanted something that was like crazy to look at on stage, interesting. You know, there were, there were bands uh, back east that, hadn't got famous, you know, uh, like the Dead End Kids and stuff like that, that had this outlandish, you know, looks and sometimes they wear contacts and all this kind of crazy stuff. And it was just more fun than seeing mm -hmm. guys in, you know, just a t-shirt or whatever that didn't sort of look like they just got off work. I wanted to look, to, to feel like I was getting my money's worth. So I wanted to be that guy that was giving you your money's worth. And I, I still feel like, like that, you know. Yeah, I, I notice in your performing as well, which we'll get to. So you guys uh, moved to L.A. You were in Hollywood being part of the, the strip scene there yeah, at the, uh, we did. the Troubadour. Um, you know, we had an interesting way of doing it. Most people just worked another job and uh, would play once a month in Hollywood to make it an event and hang out at the Rainbow. And we didn't do that. We went to like West Covina and played Top 40 stuff. And then we'd come to Hollywood and play our thing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then we'd go to some other area. Sometimes, I mean, we got as far as uh, Arizona. So you could make a living, though. You could yeah. make a living while you were to doing To make a living, this. yeah. And what was the scene like in Hollywood in those clubs? That, that was it pretty, was fantastic. Pretty it was crazy. I mean, it was everybody just loved rock so much. They couldn't get enough of Twisted Sister, Motley Crue, Rat, Van Halen. I mean, it was all mm -hmm. that. And it mm -hmm. was perfect fertile ground for what we were trying to do. However, all the record companies said, well, we already have them. We're looking to the next thing. I'm sorry, you guys are a day late and a dollar short. Really? And we're like, but we're not like them. Mm -hmm. We're more, we're not like Van Halen. We're more like Aerosmith or we're more like, that, you know, uh, but they didn't get it. But and good pop tunes at the, at the core of it all. And exactly. Who, who wrote most of those? We wrote together. We'd get in a room, just like a garage band. You know, I always said where the one of the world's greatest garage bands. I mean, just set up like we were doing a show and somebody would say, hey, I got an idea, you know? Oh, let me play along to that. That's Can great. Can you do it a little bit like halftime? Okay, let's try that. You know, uh, like that style. And, and that's what was fun about, by the way, skipping ahead when I joined, put together Devil City Angels, uh, Tracy Guns and I went about it that same way. And that, that's what I loved. He didn't want to sit in a room and write a song with a drum machine. He wanted that interaction, and I said, that's the way I know how to write. More and, organic. Yeah. More right. organic. But that's the way Poison's always done it. And uh, so, sure, sometimes somebody will come in with something that's a little more together. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, I've got a, 
a melody and I've got this and I've got that. Sometimes I'll pick up the guitar. I play good enough to get an idea across and I'll say, hey, this is, what about this? This kind of thing. Because I have a rhythmic right. sense. And so I think CeCe's always liked that, that that rhythmic sense was there. He's from Brooklyn, New York, by the way. He's the only one that's not from PA. He came on the band later. He did, yes. And he's a virtuoso guitarist. He's great. He's underrated. Very underrated. I He's a so great well. songwriter, too. So walk me through when it first started to hit. You got your record deal, and you went in to do the first record with Poison. How, how did that all go? go well, down? it didn't quite happen like that. We, we got a deal. We couldn't get a deal. We got turned down by everybody, uh, at least twice. That, that's my claim to fame, is we got turned down by every record company at least twice, <laughs> and, uh, ex except the Nigma Records. And right. uh, they really, really liked what we were doing, and they saw the potential in it. And we sold 38,000 copies on our own. And so when Capital came along and said, we want to scoop a few bands up, um, they took the Smithereens, they took Poison, they took Striper. And, um, and sort of like, um, how can I say this? Enigma became the A&R department for Capital for those bands. Okay. Follow what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so what was nice is we didn't have anybody from Capital telling us what to do in the studio. It was Enigma guys, which were, they were whatever makes sense. But we had this sense about us that we wanted, our whole idea was 12 songs, 12 hits. That was what we were after. I mean, you don't, you shoot for that, you know, you fall short of it, but you go for it. No filler material. We want 12 songs, 12 hits. Give us a poster and a tour and we'll rule the world. That's what we want. Well, the first hit was Talk Dirty to Me. These Regal Tip Session sticks feel great. They kind of put me in the mindset of a thinner and lighter 5A. Go to regaltip.com, order a pair, or go to your nearest music store. Pick up a pair, let us know exactly how you feel about the stick. Yes, it was a first hit. It was not our first release. Our first release was a song called Cry Tough, which we wrote living in downtown, you know, on Washington Boulevard, which was just horrible. We had gaps under the door with cockroaches. I mean, it was... We all lived together? I, yeah. And, and I still, to this day, before I put my shoes on, always go like this to make sure there's nothing in them. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, I do that because I'm from New Orleans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like four guys living together. And living road on crew. Ramen noodles and... Oh, yeah. And road crew. And we rehearsed right there. We lived by a cleaners. And um, a band called Keel used to live in there. Ronnie Keel uh, had that place. Um, but, yeah, it was, uh, it was humbling. I mean, we, you know, there's stories for days I could tell you about living in an all-black neighborhood with four white guys from the East Coast. It was quite different. Dressing like girls uh, with, <laughs> with a rock and roll band. Yeah. Makeup and everything else. Oh, we were, well, no, I dressed very plain to walk around that neighborhood, <laughs> you know? We were only a few blocks away from where Miro's got caught. I remember that. Oh, I remember that. was happening at that time. Oh, that's where you were. Myself. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, what was it like to go from obscure Nobody knew who you were. You're struggling to make, to make ends meet. And then you're playing stadiums. It explodes. Well, what we did was we went out uh, on the road and we went out with Quiet Riot, uh, who were slipping at that, by that time. They had had some problems. They weren't doing as well as they had been doing. And we started to do really well. There was a little bit of a jealousy factor there, I think. Um, and by the way, I've, you know, all those guys, I've, Frankie Benali, I just... I think he's wonderful, uh, and he always treated us great. But I think management and everything back then, there was this terrible rivalry with any any new upcoming band. And um, it was that kind of thing that was like, okay, you guys are on in one minute, and that's when they pulled the sheet off of the soundboard. And went, Go. <laughs> so that, if you notice, to this day, we always do this 20 seconds of just free-for-all noise, da, in E. Just so the sound guy can really get everything dialed in. That's interesting. So it became this thing where we turn it into our ladies and gentlemen, boys, and you know what I mean? That way our sound guy could like go boom and start to just get a level. Make it work for you. And so we just kept it. It's our tradition. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, but emotionally, uh, all of a sudden, now you're stars. Was that difficult to deal with? 
to do what I'm saying. It's just emotionally, you know, you're 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 a band that nobody's ever heard of. You're a drummer nobody knows, and now you're a star. You're a celebrity. You're playing world stages. Well, again, it didn't quite happen like that. Um, you know, it, it was it was tough because we were fairly well known in the tri-state area, and then we moved to LA and had to start all over again. Mm -hmm. We became uh, the LA's biggest drawing band finally. Still couldn't get a deal. I see. But we did get that deal finally with uh, Enigma. And then uh, we went out in the Winnebago and did that Quiet Riot tour uh, by the skin of our teeth. And then uh, when we came back, we had released Cry Tough, and it didn't do that well. Uh, it was mediocre on MTV. And the record company said, you might want to think about the next record. And, and we're behind you. We'll do another record. We may have to make it a little less money this time. And we're like, ay, ay, ay. We said, what do we need to do to get another single? And they said, if you have another tour to promote it, we would consider that. We kissed ass to get the Rat tour. And Rat put us on tour with it. So we got another single. And that single was Talk Dirty to Me. Mm -hmm. And the phones lit up for MTV and took it to number one within weeks. So that's where the, the transition really began with that song. That's kind of what I was getting at. And we had so little money to do that video. And that's why it has zero continuity. We're, we're like, we're going to change our clothes every damn scene. We're going to just, you know, show the camera guys and just have fun with it. And, uh, and that's what we did. You can see the camera people in it. And it's just like, we're doing a video. Let's just have a good time. Let's turn it into a party. So that's when we had the silly string and we just turned it into this party. And that solidified that party image with us. I think. Nothing but a good time. Yeah. That's, that's what it, it really, that evolved us into that place, I think. Well, still today, when you go see Poison, it's a fun time. Yes. It's yes. a real fun time. So let me ask you about, you had an affinity with rockets? Yeah, I used to launch uh, high power rockets and That's big, big, big ones. I got big crazy. Ones. I got out of hand with it. Yeah. Many thousands of feet in the air. And yes. I, had a, I launched, the last big thing I did was an almost 300 pound rocket. And I got the shells from Don Lombardi at DW. And I used drum shells to build a rocket. It was a drum rocket. 20, 22 inch diameter rocket. Yeah. What, what struck your interest about rockets? Always played with that stuff. It's how I got my nickname. Yeah. yeah. So, and which became my last name. Right. It sounds cooler than Ream. Well, no, you know, I, I, I used to get I, made fun of with that last name. You know what I mean? It's can't like, imagine. So, um, <laughs> give me I get made fun of with this name too. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, my son's name sounds much cooler. Jude Rocket sounds better than Ricky cool. Rocket's pretty playful, you know. <laughs> but Richard is no. The next phase of what happened with us at that time with uh, with Talk Dirty to Me, uh, that was another band that we started to outsell. Uh, our merchandise was outselling rats. We had two T-shirts. They had ten, and we we're outselling them by three or four bucks a head every night, which meant to the promoters and everybody else that we were gaining more popularity. Mm -hmm. So although it probably bothered them, they're like, no, this makes sense to keep them out. And they just kept keeping us, us out with them. And we were with them for almost a year. And thank God for Rat because they were, they took a chance on us. Mm -hmm. They really did. And then eventually the band moved into headlining. Yes. Uh, what we did next was we came back, did another record, did another single. We landed the David Lee Roth tour, and that was when he had Greg Bissonette and his brother and all these, Vi and all these amazing players with mm -hmm. him. So that was amazing to watch every night, by the way, if they let us watch. Um, and uh, we went out with them, and we did six and a half months with David Lee Roth, and then we started the headline. And that tour, from the time we started with David Lee Roth till the time we were done, was 16 and a half months on the road. That's I crazy, saw nothing it? but a tour bus uh -huh. for all that time. It was absolutely crazy. And, and then at the end, we got offered the Moscow Peace Festival, and it was a bad slot. Uh, we would have been playing at 3 in the afternoon, and we were so exhausted, we just went, I don't think we're going to do it. And, and I wish we would have because it was a piece of history, but we would have played at 3 in the afternoon. 
you know, opening for Gorky Park or something. You know what I mean? So, um, now when did your interest in uh, motorcycles and pinstriping pop in? Uh, well, motorcycles. I've, I mean, I've been riding since I was a kid. You know, mini mm -hmm. bikes and my dad rode. All the kids in my neighborhood. I'm from a pretty suburban area outside of Harrisburg, Philly area. So everybody rode dirt bikes. You know what I mean? I've always loved motorcycles. I always, always, always. Well, where I'm going is motorcycles, rockets, pinstriping, tattoos, which was on the cover of one of your albums, right? All events eventually ends up in rocket drum works. I kind of pulled all those talents together. That's uh, what I said. Because and, and hobbies, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think I'm wonderfully talented pinstriper. I think I'm fine. I think that I think I have a good eye for design and stuff like that. Uh, but as far as drums, I've always customized my own stuff. You know what I mean? And I had never had a desire, however, to go into building drums until a guy came along and said, would you be interested in being part of my company? And I said, what the hell am I going to bring to the table All that, that hasn't already been brought to the All table? All of that stuff that we just talked about. Yeah. So and he that. said, well, look, you've been doing your own stuff. You know, all these companies have been getting credit for your ideas. They think that there's some brainchild behind it, and it's you that's riding, driving these drums around to the painters and getting stuff powder-coated. And I, mean, I found DW, their first powder-coater. Uh, his name was Jim Schaefer. And uh, so, I mean, I, I had one of the first powder-coated kits at DW. You know, now it's they do it all the time, you know what I mean? Um, so you got involved building drums, and then that became eventually Rocket Drumworks. Yes. 